Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this is a very unique panel. This is the commodity merchants. You've heard a lot of noise about this morning about production and it's coming from here and there and all that other good stuff. But these are the gentlemen who actually move it from producers to refiners and refiners to consumers. They have their finger on the pulse. They live the regulation, the changing dynamics of flows, whether it's U.S. production increases, the export of products from the U.S., where West African oil is going now, what the Asia Pacific Basin is like, etc. So I think this is a unique opportunity to do that. So as I start, I just want to show you a couple things from the financial or money world of oil. So in the last three years, open interest in the crude oil contract has basically doubled. It's gone from 200, uh, two and a half million lots of open interest to four million lots of open interest. But the trading volume, as you can see by the chart, has basically remained unchanged. The open interest continues to be held approximately 60, 65 percent by commercials and 30, 35 percent by non-commercials or speculators, hedge funds, whatever you want to call that, financial institutions. So most of this change in open interest has been the change in the industry. Two-thirds of the U.S. refinery capacity is now owned by independent refiners. They have to buy oil or futures, if you will, because they have no equity barrels and they're selling products. The other thing you see now is with new U.S. production, the way those people are financing this new drilling is by pre-selling their forward oil, and they're now a short in the crude oil market. This is the first time ever, really, in the history of the WTI contract that commercials are long crude. That's an unusual pattern, and that's the change in the industry structure. So, uh, actually, uh, Mr. Taylor and I have had the privilege of doing this a couple times together, and one of the questions we always got was where are prices going, and we only guarantee you one thing, they will move, okay? And as commodity merchants, that's all we wanted to do. We'll be wrong as well. Oh, yeah, that's right. You always lose. I remember that part. Okay. So in uh, 2011, the market was in a slight contango where forward prices were cheaper than distance prices. Okay, so it was $90 out for five years or seven years at that time. Okay, in 2012, as the world gets a little bit better from the uh, financial shakeout, the market goes into a slight backwardation. Spot oil approximately, you know, at the November contract at the end of September of that year was $93 and the forward curve had dropped down to 88. And what you're seeing now is something unusual in this deep <coughs> backwardation. You've heard people this morning talk about that it takes $100 a barrel to get the new oil or the hard oil out of the ground, and that's the bottom line. Well, as you can see, there's people selling $80 oil six years out because they're guaranteeing revenues, and that's how they're getting their money from the bank to go drilling. So the curve will change, but that is one of the features going on currently in the market. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce the panel to you, okay? And the other thing about it, they're all commodity traders, so you can ask a price question because they always have an opinion, okay? And we're all recovering economists, so we'll make forecasts, okay? So on my far right is Alex Beard, who's the director of oil trading for Glencore. Ian Taylor is the president and chief executive order of VTOL. And Torborg is the chief executive officer of Govron. So I'm going to turn it over to them for a moment, and they can give you a brief description of who they are and what they do and how they're doing it. Alex? Thanks very much. Um, for those of you who don't know, Glencore Extrata, uh, it is a $70 billion mining company, uh, but it happens to have a small oil division as well. And that's the, uh, that's the part of the business that I run here in London. Uh, Glencore in the oil industry trades more than 3 million barrels a day of crude and products. Uh, we're pretty active in most major most major uh, products worldwide, most global uh, marketing centers as well. Uh, we have a very active shipping division where we own more than uh, 35 uh, oil tankers. And we have a time charter fleet in excess of 100 vessels as well. So we have a very strong logistical chain moving crude and products around the world. Uh, as well as a substantial tankage position, uh, we own 90% of Chemoil, uh, which is a speciality bun bunkering company based in Singapore. Uh, and we also have a very large upstream position uh, upstream in combination with, uh, with the rest of our colleagues. Uh, moving into sort of the asset side of the business over the last few years is something that we focused on. So we have uh, exploration and production uh, in Russia, where we're shareholders in Rusneft, uh, and uh, in West Africa, 
where the countries we're currently uh, producing and exploring in are Chad, Equatorial Guinea, and Cameroon. Ian? I'd almost say we're the same as Alex, really, except uh, he's, he's public, so he's worth a huge amount more than we are. Um, we don't, unfortunately, have any mining, which is probably okay at the moment. Um, no, we, we, I think we're all very much similar. We, we, we're exactly the same. We, we have upstream, we have midstream, we have downstream and terminals. We probably trade a little bit more, and that's probably quite stupid because the margins are so small, it's not worth trading it anymore. Um, uh, but, you know, we're private. Um, but I think very similarly to, to, to Glencore and to, and to, uh, to Gunvor, um, you know, we're all struggling a little bit to, to work out which bit of the, 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 the streams we get into. Alex has been very successful going upstream. Um, we keep being tempted by all the assets that the majors keep offering at lower and lower prices, which is probably a mistake because there's a reason why they're so cheap. Um, and, you know, I think that's the big challenge for, for all the global arbitrage <laughs> distribution companies is what's, what we really are. Um, is how to, how to grow over the next 10 years and how to convince, hopefully, the regulators, the politicians and, and the public that we have a role to play in distributing oil and gas uh, around the world, which I believe we do, because I'm not quite sure anybody else is going to do it. Well, uh, I'm, uh, as my colleagues, we are a little bit the same. We are the smaller company of uh, the three here. Uh, Gunvor is uh, also the youngest. Uh, 12 years old, it was uh, formed as a joint venture between myself and my business partner. And disappointingly, there is no other shareholder in that constellation. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it has been, uh, the company was uh, born out of uh, the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union and the chaos and uh, the arbitrage uh, possibilities and uh, that uh, occurred and where we took full advantage of that. Since then we have uh, expanded globally. Uh, we are a global company, uh, somewhat smaller than Glencore and, uh, and uh, Vito. But uh, I think we all we see the same thing. We see that uh, to be a trader without assets is probably impossible if you want to do it on a scale. So we also embarked on the way to s buy distressed assets, and like Ian, I wonder if that's a good thing to do from time to time. But uh, I think that uh, as a trader, you have to ask yourself what your role is there, because necessarily you don't produce oil, you, even though we have upstream <coughs> operations, it would be negligible in a, in, a, in a global perspective. So what we do, I think we add competition to the market, um, we add liquidity, and uh, we cover various arbitrages, geographical and other arbitrages over the time horizon and uh, uh, products for products and all these things. So I think we provide, we have a useful position, or, like, or at least we like to think so. Not always the case from when other looks at us as pure middlemen, but uh, we try obviously to do better than that. Thank you. So for the benefit of the audience, uh, I come from a commodity merchant family myself, so, you know, I. That's why I'm having so much fun with these guys. So simplistically, commodity merchants are not really long or short the products, uh, but we're just long time and location differences, or the arbitrage. And as you try to get more, capture more merchant profits, you go upstream and downstream on the value chain. And there's various ways you could do it. <laughs> and strategically, you know, it used to be some of the rules when everybody wants it, give it to them. And when nobody wants it, take it. That might be the reason why it's hard to buy major oil assets, I guess, today. But uh, some of the things I'd like to talk about, I think that the uh, audience would benefit from, is the dramatic change in the U.S. balance, if you will, and U.S. now becoming a major exporter of products, has really changed the flow in the Atlantic Basin. You know, West Africa barrels that used to have two directions really only have one direction now. And, you know, you guys are trading those crudes and products, and are European refiners going to get smaller? You know, is more stuff going to Asia? What's the Asia refinery posture look like? And what does that do to merchant trading operations? So start anywhere you want. <laughs> well, 
I think we should start with the people who own European refineries. I mean, <laughs> like, Whoa, <laughs> that was a cheap blow. Cheap yeah. blow. It's not a cheap blow. Oh. You own European refineries. Oh. 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 I have to separate you two guys. Go ahead. Okay. But you no, know, you I mean, right well, we should, I think we should clarify one thing. I mean, I think West African crude um, has at least two directions to go. Obviously, Asia being the, the main one if it's heavy, um, and obviously a little bit more is. Uh, um, coming up to Europe, um, which is what you'd expect. Um, ironically, and, and quite ridiculously, there's a little bit um, still going into some parts of the United States, which really shouldn't be happening when it's about $10 a barrel worse than the domestic alternatives. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, um, I, you know, obviously you're absolutely right. There's huge amounts of products, and I think very, very important to note. I mean, I think for the first time ever, we saw one of the most unique movements, a ship ballasting empty to go to the Gulf Coast to pick up a cargo. And I, I stress the word ballasting empty because it means it was not taking gasoline across um, to the United States, but was the best place to find a cargo was in the U.S. Gulf Coast for distillate. And the U.S. is becoming, you know, a very major exporter of distillate. What, a million barrels a day? Something like that? Anyway, I think it's about, it's, it's, well, I think it's more, but I think it's about a million barrels a day today. So hugely important. The U.S. should be already. If there's any U.S. politicians in the room, please, can we get rid of the Jones Act? Can we start exporting crude oil? Um, there's some serious things the U.S. needs to do to benefit from all the wonderful things their upstream guys have done um, because, you know, it's not a perfect market. Um, we've already got U.S. Gulf Coast crude almost long, long and trapped. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, lot, there's a lot more to be done. But, yes, fundamentally, huge change. Um, I don't think it necessarily helps the European refiners. They've got a different problem. Um, they're rather small, and in a growing a market that doesn't grow, um, and it's not very sophisticated refining, um, it's very difficult to make money in a global world where the price is determined by the sophisticated refiners. Um, and also, arguably, just to be a bit controversial, um, you know, a crude oil price which has an element of macro geopolitic length in it which probably pushes it a little bit above a sensible refining value. But for people like Alex with all his lovely upstream, that's a very nice thing to have. Well, I think I, th there's no doubt that the US refining system I think is, is massively advantaged at the moment. I mean, uh, you, you have, as Ian said, you know, trapped crude, so you've had the, the benefit of substantial discounts, particularly in the mid cont over the last few years. But also you have uh, a very cheap, plentiful uh, fuel supply. Uh, and most US refiners are trying or have projects to convert their, their fuel to, to natural gas. Uh, and that makes you know, $1.50, $2 a barrel difference to the refining margin. So I think the US refining sector from five years ago, which looked sort of under, under extreme pressure and in great difficulty today, <coughs> looks fantastically healthy. Yeah. So I think the, the, the trend of, of US exporting products is, is going to continue. I think they're going to be on max product export. And it's really diesel to Europe. I mean, to South America as well. South America is growing strongly. Yeah, but uh, you're going to see you know, diesel coming from the United States to Europe for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's true. I think if you look at the United States uh, being a net importer of uh, refined products of uh, between 1 and 2 billion million barrels a day, actually the opposite now. Uh, the U.S. is a net exporter. So you can see the refining uh, industry in, uh, in the U.S. has really become an export industry based on, uh, number one, cheap crude oil, but also the cheap gas. If you, if you run a refinery, you run it by gas instead of oil, it's a huge difference. So U.S. refineries are going to do well. U.S. Uh, petrochemical uh, complex, you see now for the first time, plants are build uh, petrochemical plants in the United States just because of the cheap fuel. So it's certainly changing the landscape, and the loser of this is Europe. It has to be. And uh, you have some uh, all the 85 refineries, they're all small, they're scattered around, uh, there's no consol consolidation and there is no real consolidation hope. Um, last year we saw a wave of closures, uh, the uh, Petroplus uh, uh, bankruptcy, we saw uh, several other refineries closing and it tightened it up uh, the, the uh, European market temporarily. But it has come back now, the realities have come back falling demand in Europe, which is flat or losing, particularly gasoline, which is really worrying for, for many refineries, that the gasoline demand in particular has lost uh, more than uh, anticipated. And I expect uh, the next uh, two years, we will see uh, probably five, 
six plants being closed, uh, five to 700,000 barrels a day being closed in Europe. I think it's necessary uh, to bring balance there because uh, in the rest of the world it will uh, increase by about two million barrels a day uh, this year or one and a half, uh, a little bit less next year, but the following year again. So this is uh, more than uh, demand is increasing, so it's uh, clearly uh, refining is gonna be under pressure. Uh, so uh, that obviously has an impact on how uh, flow of oil is moving. And uh, we do expect, I do expect to see less crude oil movements so or crude oil moving less uh, distance on the sea when that becomes rationalized. And more movements in, uh, in, um, in uh, products tankers and uh, you can see on the order books in most, uh, most uh, shipyards, it's not for crude oil tankers, it's more for uh, product carriers. As always, ship owners seems to be their worst enemy because with so the slightest hope they go and book and now we have an order book which is huge and an already uh, somewhat glutted market. But the expectations are there and it's clearly warranted that those will be the future movements. So. It used to be the rule, and I'm talking 10, 12 years ago, that U.S. refinery was 3.95 to four and a quarter a barrel. Singapore was 2.50. Korea was 2.15. You know, Europe was 3.50 or four. But some of the numbers I read now is that the U.S. is 2.50 a barrel and Asia is four dollars. Are those numbers right? Well, I, I, I don't know. I can't. But I mean, the, the U.S. has clearly has an advantage. Um, because they can, and I think it's not only the crude oil, or it's not just the crude oil they can, the cheap crude oil they can uh, buy, um, but it's also the way they run the refineries, completely by gas. And that's a huge advantage with the price of domestic gas compared to if you have to run by oil. So they have on the cost side, I would say, compared to European, ref most European refineries, and if you're gonna be generalized, okay, so better or worse, but uh, probably an average of $2 a barrel. That would be my guess. And, uh, and uh, many Asian refiners, you have very modern refiners, uh, like the Reliance Industries and uh, some new ones coming. They also will have, uh, they're more sophisticated and they will have a cost advantage, certainly versus Europe, but not versus the States. So uh, we hear a lot about LNG and people ramping up their LNG trading teams or merchant trading teams. <coughs> and you know, I'd love to hear what you guys think is you know, LNG as a transportation fuel, is that three years away, five years away, or who knows who cares, or how is LNG gonna flow? You know, people are building Singapore t uh, trading teams, you know, that's sort of the story. Well, is I think, I mean, LNG we really a, We all have LNG trading teams. I think LNG is a, is a fuel of the future. I mean, it's already here today. I think people are designing and looking at designing ships, cars, trains, uh, you know, diesel carriers, trucks, mining industry, I mean, everything, Everything that, that, that can look to convert to LNG as a fuel source is, is looking to convert because you know, there's no doubt that for the future you can see the price disparity between LNG and, and, and oil and anything related to oil, whether that's diesel or fuel oil or whatever you're running there. Gas is, uh, is, has a massive price advantage. So heavy industry in the United States is a complete renaissance for heavy industry driven by natural gas prices. So I think it's, uh, you know, the, you can talk about sort of the revolution of the future and of course to, to refit a whole fleet of cars or a whole fleet of ships uh, to, to run on gas is gonna take decades, you know, generations. But I think it's starting already. Uh, people are looking everywhere, they're looking to, to convert to energy. I mean, obviously that's absolutely right. Um, but I think it's important that we should stress that there's not a huge LNG free trading market. I mean, we're all staffing up because we probably believe we need to. Um, but if these guys, well, maybe they, they're doing a lot better than we are, but nobody's making a fortune trading LNG. There's not that much LNG tradable um, it's very much a still a point-to-point -point producer consumer business um, I mean, I think it's not it's fair to say that virtually all the big projects that we all know about are all pretty late uh, look like they're going to be later um, and, and while gas is incredibly important and obviously very valuable based on US pricing you know I think there's very very limited amount of LNG trading compared to what we see in virtually every other commodity so oil or coal or there, 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 is, there is a few cargoes. I mean, if more than, what, three, four LNG cargoes are done a day? Not so much. Right. Very rare. Very, very rare. In fact, one a day is rare, almost. So, but, but, well, the growth, days but, but the growth is coming from gas, which is why, that's you know, 
That's why we're going to be in here. That's why we're paying these ridiculous sums for traders who claim they can trade it. Okay. <laughs> we will take resumes for traders after the uh, session closes. And as you can tell, traders don't have to have any education bases or anything else. So. Okay. Oh, that's a bit hard. <laughs> We're all, we well, all I, I, I thought we all resembled that remark. Oh, no, no. Okay. no. Okay. We all went to school, you know. <laughs> okay. Function. So, a uh, different question. Um, in the aftermath of 08, 09 and regulatory changes and the banks getting under high stress, there's been lots of different stories about banks exiting certain parts of their enterprises, commodity trading uh, in general or oil trading, et cetera. Do you really see these people leaving? I, I think, uh, I'll start, I think, uh, yeah, not everybody. But I do believe there are aspects of, uh, of uh, the trading that the banks probably would have to uh, leave and they would do it for, uh, for many reasons. I think if you speak to many bankers, and uh, I asked the question to some bank, I said, why do you do trading in commodities? And I asked, why do you do it? And he said, that's a very good question. Uh, I didn't want to do it, but they told me to do it, so I'm doing it. Uh, I mean, there are lots of downsides. If you're going to be in a bank, uh, you're going to make a difference. You have to make big bets. And we've seen what that can lead to, uh, control functions inside uh, the banks. Uh, if it's really going to make a miss, you have to do that. And if you're going to be successful in prop trading, you probably have to be also in a bit of the fiscal side. And this equation means that the bank has probably come to the conclusion is uh, no one's going to thank them for making money in commodities, but they will all be slaughtered if they make mistakes. And there's all sorts of... Uh, problems if you go into agricultural uh, commodities and they, they rise up, they can be, uh, be labeled as irresponsible and so forth. For, for many banks, it's just, just too much downside to be in uh, commodities. It's not only that they don't make money, but it is, I think it's downside for them to be involved in, uh, in that as banks. you agree? Um, to a certain extent, I think in reality, I think we're talking here about the U.S. investment banks mainly. Um, and I think it will come down to what the regulator will allow them to do, right. um, particularly when it comes to physical trading and physical assets. Uh, to a certain extent, I think we all have to admit that you know, their role in derivatives markets, to a large extent, I maybe hope they stay because they do provide very necessary liquidity um, and they often think more sensibly than perhaps some of the hedge funds and one or two other people who are participating. So from that point of view, um, I, you know, I, I, I suspect they will stay to a certain extent. And I think it's important for us to stress that although, yes, I think Torbjorn's right, I think that the U.S. investment banks will largely probably over the next few years diminish their activities. There are lots of people still looking to come in. Um, we probably have two or three new entrants in the last uh, six months. Um, and the national oil companies, the big integrated companies uh, in Asia continue to want to um, be very uh, aggressive participants. So I'm not sure that it's going to be a major change, even if, even if the banks were to you know, become a less of a feature, particularly in the physical side. I, you know, I think probably we're hoping it's going to be a positive change, but I suspect it won't be. Oh, yeah, I think the names change, but, uh, but the business remains the same, to be honest. I think. Uh, as entrance into the physical market, uh, most of those banks, most of the sort of the Wall Street investment banks were not huge players in, in the physical market. I mean, there were some exceptions, you know, Morgan Stanley Distillate Business or, or something like that. They were, they were big players there. But uh, I think taken as a whole, sort of U.S. investment banks were, were much more focused on the paper, the derivative, the, the customer hedging side of the business. And I think a large part of that activity will remain the same. You know, whether it will be under those particular two or three U.S. banks or whether it will migrate to a series of European banks and some of the U.S. banks remain, I think uh, yeah, remains to be seen. But I don't think the business is fundamentally going to change. For us as physical traders, you know, whether the, the, those banks are there or not doesn't make a difference. As Ian points out, we have national oil companies, we have major oil companies, we have independent traders, we have new you know, trading companies supported by private equity, we have banks from South America, we have, I mean, we have Plenty of physical participants in, in the business that the, the Wall Street guy is leaving doesn't make a big difference. Sort of the rotation that yeah, we see the, every the names change, but right. uh, the business stays the same. Yeah, I mean, I think right. it's in, the, the one thing is interesting actually, though, as you see, Morgan Stanley has put the business up for sale, JP Morgan's put it up for sale, Goldman Sachs hasn't said anything. 
So I, I would see, I'm not sure I see the buyers from Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan. I'm not sure who's going to buy that. None business. have surfaced yet. Not yet. But you know, just to prove your point, you know, Goldman Sachs, who used to be a large trader of physical crude oil, you know, they haven't touched physical crude since like 97. Or so they say. <laughs> They still have a good commodities business. Sure. Yes, I think they the reason they still have a good think the, re the reason you haven't heard from them is because they intend <laughs> to keep the damn thing <laughs> if they can. <laughs> but I think your point's uh, very valid <laughs> that they do a lot of structure. Yeah. You know, they had a lot of liquidity, you know, sure. sometimes to the front, but a lot of liquidity in the back. And, yeah. you know, these financial markets, you know, help fund E&P, refinery building, and stuff like so that. And the forward curve, Absolutely. they provide yep. a very valuable surface to the industry. I'm yeah. sure that's going to lead into a question on regulation that Ian wants to talk about. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> He's itching to talk about that. <laughs> the, the serious point is liquidity, though. I mean, if you don't yeah. have these kinds of banks, if you don't have market participants adding liquidity, in the end, it doesn't do the consumer any service at all. So over yeah. to you for the question. It did offer spreads widen. For sure. You know, liquidity diminishes. The board gets shorter in length. You can't do for forward deals as much as you can. So um, I guess from the trader exchange perspective, the industry has been, uh, and the banks particularly, have been, you know, under the cloud of Dodd-Frank for it seems ever now. Okay. But uh, recently that's gotten a little clearer. I don't know if it's a lot clearer, but a little clearer. And some of the people I've talked to now are saying, if you think, we're thinking the CFTC is good compared to the EU, because EU regulation seems very onerous to a lot of traders. Is that the way you sort of view it? Or are they just both different um, versions of bad? I think, I mean, the, the process, as you rightly say, in the States was a relatively long process. It's still not finished. Um, and I think, to a certain extent, the industry was able to participate in that process and I don't think any of us are is particularly happy because it means that quite a lot more work, quite a lot more um, uh, organizational changes, system changes, um, but I think the definition, I mean, for, I think for all the three of us, the key elements are things like an ability to hedge um, and liquidity as, as Alex has said. The EU situation is, I think, just beginning in some ways. Obviously, it's been very, um, perhaps, the commodity business has been somewhat dragged in to the whole issues of financial derivatives like LIBOR and other things. And the way that the EU is structured um, means there could be some quite some considerable crossover and things which probably aren't relevant to the financial, to, to the commodities market right. from the financial markets are, are being applied to both sides. So I think it's quite a complex situation. I think there's no doubt about it. Probably in Europe, we don't have particularly strong industry associations who may be able to help perhaps engage and explain um, what we do. And maybe we need to do a better job of trying to do that ourselves. And, you know, and I think it is difficult because um, you know, we tend to, although I think the markets have worked pretty well, we tend to just assume that everybody accepts that we're doing a reasonable job in a transparent way. And that's probably not good enough anymore. Um, but yes, I think we are concerned about some of the initial draft um, legislation that's, well, draft proposals coming forward. I think the reason we're concerned is it looks like they could make liquidity significantly worse. And then that, that's, I think, a really major problem because I worry it'll make our business uh, much more difficult and probably push up prices where they shouldn't do because nobody will be able to, to risk arbitrage. And that's, I think, a big concern. Yeah, so suppose it's taking capital off the table, so you just can't carry as many arbitrage, well, right? Well, to a certain extent, that's true, but it's, it's mainly because, you know, if you really can't hedge something, you're not going to make a trade, trade, or you're going to need a significantly bigger margin before you make a trade. So the Pacific Basin, okay, uh, ESPO is still priced against Oman, which is de facto Brent, right? Mm. Or not? Is that separating? Let Torbjorn do that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> he was the ESPO king. I know that. <laughs> well, I mean, um, I think when you talk about benchmarks, it's, uh, it's uh, obviously you can only have so many benchmarks. You have the WTI and you have Brent. Otherwise, you risk to have a benchmark becoming a benchmark of a benchmark. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I think there's been attempts, there's been attempts with, uh, with the Russian oil. And I think for different reasons, that is uh, clearly premature, even though it's a substantial flow because you have so much 
one side of sellers, one side of buyers, and you have to have a free buying and selling. So it's a very, very complicated issue before you can uh, establish a benchmark. Many, many uh, wrote uh, WTI off a few years ago, and just see how it has come back. It's, uh, it's, it's, it has a, its relevance again. Brent has shown it has uh, sustainability, and uh, and the participants has a real will uh, to continue with that. Uh, for me, uh, it's difficult to see another benchmark coming in to play today, which is meaningful. I do, I'd agree with Torben. I think Brent has, has done a very good job, actually, of being an international market. Uh, I think that the industry participants in Europe have shown a, uh, the, you know, the equity participants as well as the industry participants have shown a real willingness to, to maintain and continue that benchmark. And I think a, a sort of a North Sea market grade is freely traded, it's freely uh, arbitrageable to anywhere in the world, it's totally transparent, and I think it is probably the preeminent marker these days. Uh, WTI has had its issues, I think it will survive, because you need a, a United States crude oil marker, and I, you know, despite the, the many uh, imperfections of that system, which have been demonstrated over the last few years, I, I, I don't think there's a credible alternative. And uh, as for a, a marker in the forest, I'm not sure we need ESPO as a crude marker, really. I think it's, uh, I think it's fine being a derivative of a, of a Dubai market or an Oman market, which is a, it's not exactly the equivalent of Brent, but I mean, there's, there's a substantial amount of sort of east-west arbitrage, sweet sour arbitrage there, right. which drives Brent Dubai and Brent Oman. But I, I don't think you really need a, an eastern crude oil marker, which comes out of sort of eastern Russia and, and arcs into Japan and China. I don't think that provides any particular price discovery or liquidity service for, for anybody other than those, those participants. I agree with everything that's been said. I, I do think it's probably worth putting a small you know, point in that Oman, I mean, I don't, think, I don't think Dubai really exists anymore. It's hardly, there's no production. Um, so it really should be, it should be removed from any um, formulas of crude oil, really. It's, it's crazy that it exists. Um, but, you know, I think Oman does just has, you know, the DME has managed to survive. And probably I would argue that, that there is a little bit of discovery there, a little bit of benchmark there which just about becomes the third benchmark. And if you were to look way out and if Canadian oil could make it to the Pacific, would that be enough of a free oil that could change the North Basin? It could be. I mean, you had ANS as a marker before, sort of a, a US North America I mean, sour if, grade. If it got into an ESPO ANS Canadian it could thing, be a FOB West Coast Canada right? uh, grade. I mean, depends on the infrastructure, but uh, I think as as we heard over the, the speech at lunchtime, I mean, the infrastructure and logistics needed to, to export enough crude oil out of Western Canada to make that a reality are a long way away, I think. So. Not going to happen. Probably not. <laughs> okay. So we're a little behind schedule, so we'll sort of ask for some questions from the audience. The doctor, okay. Does he scare you? He always scares me when he's behind the microphone. <laughs> I know that he's a bit of a glutton for punishment because uh, you mentioned about the low liquidity on the LNG side, but you still go out and bid for supply. So either you know something that we don't know or uh, you like the challenge. Uh, that's number one question. Number two question to the whole panel. Uh, before uh, Fatih Barol writes the new book about the golden age of coal, I wanted to bring it out, that is there a golden age of coal coming and uh, are any of you doing something to position yourself to take advantage of this golden age? Yeah, I think Yours that's him again. <laughs> You're long coal, right? He's, he's we have, have a little bit of coal. A little bit of coal. <laughs> <laughs> little bit of coal. <laughs> Talk your book. So I think, uh, well, I mean, Glen Strata is one of the world's largest producers of, of thermal coal, and, and uh, my coal colleague will, uh, I, I've, I'm going to demonstrate that I've been listening to everything that he said over the last couple of years, because uh, we certainly believe in the future of coal. Um, we think that, uh, you know, it's still the, the predominant sort of fuel source for, for power generation for many countries in the world. There are clearly issues around about uh, emissions and, and the future of sort of clean fuel. Coal has, has definitely, I think, some work to do in that regard in terms of its PR and in terms of investing in new technology to try and clean up coal. But there's no doubt that it remains a, a substantial fuel source and one that we believe has a, has a future there. If you look at the, the sort of the price action in the coal market over the last uh, you know, 12, 18 months, it's really been driven by excess supply. It's the major mining companies bringing on a lot of coal production. There's nothing wrong with coal demand. 
you know, thermal coal demand is growing very strongly in, in emerging economies, and so I think you know, there's definitely a, a future. Whether we'd call it a golden age or not is, is another question. I think that the golden age is more likely than gas, but uh, coal, I think, has a very strong place to play in, in a future energy mix. Well, I would agree to what Alex said. I think we've taken this view as well. Um, if you look at um, the future power generation in China, India, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, you know where it's going to come from. Even though we talk about gas and LNG, this is not, not, not enough of it. And it's many, many, many years ahead. The infrastructure needs to be built to carry the gas. It's not a conversion. China is, has to, uh, each year, has to uh, increase its uh, power, uh, power uh, production at the size of the UK every year. And the question is where it's going to come from. It's going to be a mixture, but the backbone of that will have to come from coal. Now, China is a big domestic uh, producer, so they just import a very, very fraction of what they, what they use. But I think if you look at India, you look at Korea, uh, coal uh, is going to be because uh, it's not another, there's not an alternative. So for many, many years, it will have a strong growth. And along that line, you know, 75% uh, of the power generated in China is coal-fired. That's not changing. They can't change the dial that fast. <laughs> Please. Uh, thank you. David Knapp, Energy I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Which question? The Golden Age uh, of Coal? No, no, no. Oh, you, 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 you. Trying to get <laughs> no, I mean, I, just very quickly, Ferdinand, just to, by the way, Ferdinand's the best LNG analyst in the world. And if you don't take his incredibly expensive work, I highly recommend you should do. Um, but uh, yeah. just two quick things. I'm not quite as bullish as these two guys on coal. I think uh, traveling around China and India, I think there'll be such a huge push uh, to gas. Um, and depending on how successful the pipelines are from Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, et cetera, and fracking is in China, I suspect we might see coal at the margins come off a little bit. So I'm not quite as bullish. Um, LNG, there are very few freely tradable sources. Therefore, we will bid on every single one of them. The trouble is, my wonderful colleagues here on the platform will also bid on every single one of them. So, makes, not much choice. That makes a market. That makes a market, yeah. yeah. A seller's market. David Knapp, uh, Energy Intelligence Group. Um, w as Albert said, that you guys uh, arbitrage across distances, but also across time. I have a feeling there's a new type of time arbitraging that's available where it isn't about energy, energy commodities, it's about energy assets. So in deals where they're a part of the currency has to do with, say, future uh, energy production or oil production, uh, is there a role for your trading companies in that new, uh, new function? Well, you've actually participated in that recently, right? Doing some very forward uh, pricing in uh, Russian products, right? Well, I think it's less, less forward pricing than uh, sort of traditional pre-export yeah, financing. I mean, uh, Glencore and Vitol put together a, a very large pre-export finance facility for, for Rosneft. Um, but there was there's no element of hedging or forward price protection there. It's, it's purely a, a financial mechanism where you know, we agree to, to lift crude oil at market prices from, from Rosneft there. Uh, so I think the, the, you know, the role of the trading company in, in raising money and, and supporting producers is still is still a very strong one. I think there's still a lot of, of potential business that, that we've been doing for years where we can pre-export finance, where you can, you can fund capital uh, projects, you can fund drilling programs, you can fund refinery expansions, uh, and all in exchange for, for what in the end is, is what we live by, is crude and products, a flow of crude and products to trade. And, and, we're, and, we're, well, and we're all doing it, and, and I think that's true. I mean, um, you know, adding in often a derivative element to it to, to hedge some of the, the, the capital risk that's at stake. So. I'd agree. I think that is what is happening. Yeah. And originally, we just called it merchant banking, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, <laughs> true. So it's the evolution of that. This well, it's, 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 it's fair to say. I think the trading house it has taken over some of the rules, some of the, the bank bank's role. role, and we do take, we do give uh, credits uh, sometimes where banks wouldn't give credit because we know the situation on the ground. For sure. So we feel comfortable with taking that type of risk. And I think uh, for, for a moment, uh, we haven't touched so much about upstream, but there is a role for trading houses in upstream in a big way. I think uh, it depends how you look at it. Uh, from a trading house, uh, financially, it can be very interesting if you do the right investment. It's, it's good to do. But do you add anything really to the, to the upstream sector? 
And the first answer when you think about it may be no, but actually there are many small uh, um, exploration companies who are struggling with finance. And uh, the only way they can get it from today is from trading houses like ourselves, which has the capability to do so. Yeah, I think, I think that just the trading companies you know, add a lot in, in the upstream sector. I mean, I think it, actually it's an interesting distinction because you know, we are sitting up here as trading companies, but in the end, you know, it's maybe slightly more uh, pointed today for us because we're public rather than private, but in the end, we exist to make money for our shareholders. Uh, we're, not, uh, we're not selling Mars bars, we're not selling confectionery or, or a service to customers as our raison d'etre. You know, you know, the point of our business is, is to make money. And we make money for shareholders being you know, a valuable sort of component of the supply chain. But as trading companies, if we feel that we can deliver returns to shareholders by upstream activity or by refining or by shipping or by any other area of the business, you know, we will chase the returns for shareholders. And I would argue that's always been the position of the commodity merchant firms. You know, where the bank or lack of banking to a small client has always been assumed by the merchant, whether it's, you know, paying at the door or, sure. you know, 110 net 45, and if they get a little funny, it turns into net 90, you know? Merchant's been doing that forever. So, any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Stephen George, KBC. I'm curious to know if there's a uh, long-term future for U.S. LNG exports. Uh, Torburn, you said that the U.S. was, well, there wasn't enough LNG around today, and obviously there's a lot of interest in exporting LNG. But if there's this forthcoming renaissance in uh, U.S. cheap energy, uh, restoring basic industry, refining, et cetera, do you think there'll be a surplus of LNG to come out of the United States, or are all these plants sort of speculative, like the Colorado River running you know, dry before it hits the sea? Thank you. Well, uh, Yes, I mean, the U.S. will export LNG, if I'm not mistaken, some uh, 40 million ton or so per year. It's already been uh, committed. Cool. committed. And we can expect that numbers to go up as long as the political process. But I think that we'll see a higher level of um, LNG export. And uh, converting natural gas to LNG is, uh, is a highly profitable business for those who can do so and get the, the uh, plants uh, in place in, uh, in export ports. Uh, the arbitrage is huge, natural gas to price in Japan, and, uh, and, uh, and that's, uh, that's one of the most, uh, I would say, most uh, profitable business in the oil industry today. Yeah, because I think there's been four licenses approved in the states, right? It's up to four now? And just to show you, states basically at 350 to $5 for natural gas in a Henry Hub scenario, it costs six to sort of freeze it and take it to Japan, right? Something like that? Yeah, less, yeah. So, you know, U.S. nat gas in the arbitrage would, you know, whenever that opens, is delivering Japan at $11, $12. So don't you think the U.S. economy will find a way to suck up some of that capacity? Nope. And I, and I, sorry, I, I think no. you're right. It will suck up quite Absolutely. a bit. The question is how much? And yeah. is it going to be any more than four projects approved? I suspect probably not a lot more. Because I think we'll see, you know, more petrochemicals, more transportation, and that that, that arbitrage that Albert talks about <coughs> will go, yeah. will dissipate. Yeah, but, he's, but all equally, vacuums are filled. But equally, gas is not going to stay at three to five dollars. No. I mean, if you if you start permitting export terminals and building an industrial infrastructure to run more gas in the United States, then prices will rise, Absolutely and right. people will start drilling for more gas. The no. important thing is the resource base is there. From a trader's perspective, you want to be long four dollar natural gas in the state or short $17 natural gas in Japan. I tell you, you want to be long $4 natural gas in the States. And it's very difficult to do both. Yes. But well, you can't do either. either. Right. <laughs> Somebody can figure that out, though. There's one more there. Yes, I'm sorry. Please. Hi, Ian Bourne from Argus. How big is the risk that uh, EU benchmark legislation is currently framed uh, would damage liquidity, which you mentioned on the panel, um, interfere with hedging, and possibly distort benchmarks in the EU. And if that risk is very big, what do the gentlemen of the panel uh, do about that? And what do people in the room do to head, head off that risk? Can I start with that? The current one, the EU um, proposed uh, regulation has like three different parts. The first part I think that is more important to the trading community is, it just says an increased margin scenario. 
So you would raise original margin in these positions somewhere between 15 and 30 percent. That takes liquidity out of the market. I think that's the biggest real risk in the regulation. The U.S. regulation is going to result in approximately a 15 percent increase in original margin. The FIA, which is the Futures Industry Association, believes that American FCMs will have to put up an additional $100 billion to cover the margin increases. Now, I would assume the EU is, if, if the $100 billion number is right for the U.S., the EU number is $60 billion probably. But it could, I think it has a liquidity prospect from cash. Yeah, I mean, I think the ins these guys, by the way, are very in tune with it. So be, we have to be careful here because they know more about it than we do. Um, it's quite complicated. Um, obviously, the EU is looking to possibly regulate both the price reporting agencies right. as well as regulate exactly how submissions are made and who can make submissions. It's, a, it's, quite, a, it's quite a detailed, complicated um, uh, sort of piece of work. And I think, you know, yes, liquidity is the big concern. Transparency is a concern. Um, and I think what we've got to do is all of us have got to start, you know, making the arguments about why, and if we can improve the current system, I'm all for it, but why we shouldn't go the way that they are proposing uh, in certain areas that, that, that they, they, they'd like to go. And, you know, I think this is a debate we've just got to have in a very, you know, open and, and, and productive and way. And no, I was amazed when you made an earlier comment that, you know, the way the industry lobbies, for lack of a better word, in the U.S., that formation isn't really here in Europe. It's not. And that, that could be a judgment to the system. Yes, sir. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Uh, Marcelo Martinez, Tech Petrol. I go back to the uh, price of the U.S. Uh, if, because of all these uh, movements in demand in the U.S. and LNG demand for the U.S., if we have Henry Hub at maybe $6 per million BTU, because the future, uh, if you go three years from now, it is six today. So if that's the case, and Chenier adds 15% to those $6, that's 6 dining plus $3 for, for, you know, liquefaction, more or less, that's uh, around um, $10 plus 4 to $5 to get to China. So wh what I think, and it's, it's not a question more than a comment, that it's going to be very difficult that uh, we need still to add the margin for, you know, the traders here. Don't so, worry about okay. us. Okay. No, yes. <laughs> one dollar is, <laughs> one dollar is okay. So my comment is, is we are very, very close going from the U.S. three or four years from now to what it is today in uh, China and Japan. There's going to be no uh, good news, most likely. Uh, sorry. Well, th these windows stay open a very small amount of time. Actually, the next panel is about to do that. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your uh, kind observations. And I want to thank the panel for participating.